Good. The anticipation. Welcome back to So To Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I am, as always, your host, Nico Perino. We have an exciting podcast uh, and live stream video for you all today. We're going to be discussing uh, the Constitution of Knowledge, a defense of truth, which is Jonathan Rausch's forthcoming book. When is it due out, Jonathan? June 22nd. Very exciting. Still time yeah. to pre-order. Mark your calendars. <laughs> yeah, the hard copies showed up the other day. Woohoo! There it is, back from the printer. It's gorgeous. I've got the collector's edition, uncorrected page proofs. <laughs> We're also here, of course, with Greg Lukianoff. He is the president and CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, FIRE, a regular guest here on So To Speak. Hi, Interwebs. Okay. Um, I didn't realize <laughs> you are going to be able to see me from the bottom down, so I wore my, um, my uh, uh, cargo shorts, but I realized, you know what? I'm a Gen Xer and I'm a dad and I'm going to live my truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the first day that the conference rooms at our office are open, so we figured we'd make use of it. But that also means that we get a wider shot and get to see uh, Greg Shorts. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I dressed up for the occasion, but, but now I feel the 61 years old that I actually am. I intended to dress up, but then I realized that all of my shirts with collars just need to go to the dry cleaners because I haven't gone out into public in a year or whatever it's right, been. Moths so. fly out of that closet. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Also, my wife was asleep when I woke up this morning, so I couldn't see into the closet. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll use that excuse, too. But let's get into it, Jonathan. We, you were the first guest on this podcast almost five years ago. Know, incredibly. It seems like a different era. Yeah, and we were discussing your book, Kindly Inquisitors. Now we're discussing the Constitution of Knowledge. Let's just start... What is the Constitution of Knowledge? So this is the system of norms and institutions that we, all of us, rely on to keep us as a society collectively moored to reality as opposed to unmoored to reality. There are two or three big concepts underlying this book. Um, and the first of them, maybe the most important, is it's not the marketplace of ideas. It's the Constitution of Knowledge. It turns out free speech is essential, it's important. I'll be a lifelong advocate, but it's not enough to make knowledge because humans are inherently biased and we don't see our biases. And the only way to turn our views into knowledge is not just to speak because then you get a cacophony, you get people following each other down rabbit holes of conformism and confirmation bias. You have to have a structured social conversation, negotiation, and that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of settings. It takes building institutions like courts and law enforcement and um, scientific organizations and academia and newsrooms and all of this stuff that we rely on to turn these conversations in productive directions. And then the second big idea of the book is all of that is what's coming under attack right now in an unprecedented way from cancel culture and trolling and disinformation and other enemies that you and I weren't even talking about five years ago. Yeah, let's put some color on that. You have this yeah. great paragraph <clears throat> in the book. You say, consider a shaggy-haired man furiously scribbling equations and theories in his room in Bern, Switzerland. Perhaps he is Albert Einstein, discovering new truths which will rearrange the whole universe. Or perhaps he is a madman who writing gibberish. Either way, he thinks is a genius. he is a genius doing great science. Even in principle, however, he is not doing science as long as he works alone. Can you explain that? Yeah, you know, we tend to think that where knowledge comes from, um, objective reality, is us thinking well. And that's true. It's important, you know, to be, to be logical and sensible. But that's not where reality comes from. The, the great breakthrough in Western society that allows for, for example, the shot that I got in my left shoulder that's protecting me from COVID right now, isn't from individuals thinking well. It's from creating this constitution of knowledge, this social process where we outsource our ideas of reality to this vast social network of literally any given day, millions, tens, maybe hundreds of millions of people looking for each other's mistakes mm -hmm. in a structured way. So that's where scientific knowledge comes from. A person alone in a room, you know, that could be a madman, it could be Einstein, but it's only when other people acquire those ideas, start to test them, to debate them in an impersonal way, 
that's mm -hmm. crucial. And in a non-coercive way, mm -hmm. that's also crucial. That's where you actually look at those ideas, evaluate them, refine them, decide to send them on to other nodes in the network. What comes out of that network at the other end, that's our knowledge. Is, is that not sort of a marketplace, though? I mean, the idea that you take your goods, your ideas, so to speak, and put them into the marketplace for either people to purchase or not purchase. I know you say this, is, this isn't about the marketplace of ideas and freedom of speech is important, but it is kind of like that, right? Yeah. And I know Greg's like very criti critical of the marketplace <laughs> of ideas, idea in general. Necessary you know, actually, but not sufficient. I, yeah, necessary but not sufficient. That's exactly right. I, I love the metaphor as far as it goes, but here's the problem. Mm -hmm. The marketplace of ideas metaphor makes it sound like you've got this abstract world where ideas are clashing where people are trading ideas as individuals. Um, and the problem with that is it doesn't prepare us for the attacks that we're facing now because those, are, those attacks are not based on abstract conceptions of ideas somehow clashing out there. Mm -hmm. They're based on the real world where it's important, for example, that you have organizations like the National Weather Service, National, o National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that are actually systematically doing the hard work of comparing in rigorous, organized ways according to rules. And that's what people like Donald Trump, you know, when he changes the weather forecast, mm -hmm. that's what those guys are attacking. So the notion that somehow the market of place of ideas is that it all takes care of itself. If you have freedom, that's enough. The good stuff will happen automatically. The attackers right now all recognize that's not the case and that they can disrupt all of these mechanisms in the middle all of these things like courts of law and government agencies and academia, your bailiwick, that they can disrupt all of that. They can game it, they can manipulate it, they can organize it for political gain, and that's what they're doing. The marketplace of ideas doesn't really help you with that because it kind of assumes, well, you know, we'll all just talk and more speech will be better speech. Yeah, is, is this marketplace of knowledge new? I mean, is it, or has this always existed and we've just kind of formalized it more recently. You talk about medicine uh, in your book and the development of medicine. It's probably a good place to kind of explain how the Constitution of knowledge develops within an, any given sphere, right? Yeah, the ideas go back to the mid-1600s and, and John Locke, mm -hmm. our old friend, <laughs> um, who's actually the founder of both epistemic liberalism, meaning the constitution of knowledge where we get knowledge and also political liberalism, our constitutional structure. So no coincidence that they line up in a lot of ways. But the actual, what I call the reality-based community, which is all of us who are in a day-to-day -day way participating in making knowledge, that's uh, law and government and journalism and especially research, science, academia, all of that is more recent, and it grows up basically mostly over the last 200 years. And yeah, medicine is a good example, because for many centuries we had medical ideas, but we had no way to systematically turn those into knowledge, right, mm -hmm. and figure out, so what are actually best practices, what works and what doesn't. And it's only in sort of actually a bit over 100 years ago, in the 19th century, that you begin to systemize that by getting a medical community, organizations like the AMA, research universities that began doing controlled experiments, journals that began publishing those experiments, mm -hmm. regulations that began saying you have to pass certain tests in order to be medication. It's only then that you bring these various kind of home remedies and random cures that people are using into direct uh, contestation. You begin to weigh them, you begin to say, well, okay, this works, penicillin really works, where, you know, um, um, alligator tonics don't work. And you see that replicated all across the spectrum. You see it in, in my field, which is journalism. 19th century journalism in the U.S. was uh, just absolutely ridden with extreme partisanship and fake news. Gossip. Gossip. Um, arguably started the Spanish-American War <laughs> just for circulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that was changed by people making deliberate choices just over 100 years ago to set up the American Society of Newspaper Editors, which promulgated ethics standards, journalism schools, mm -hmm. which began to train people in better and worse ways of doing things, you know, second sourcing, checking back for comments, running timely corrections. Um, and you began to get structured newsrooms that were organized around these conventions of, okay, we're, we're going we're gonna to stay truthful and here's how we're going to do it. 
So that's not just sort of the marketplace of ideas spontaneously arising. These are actual human beings who make these social decisions to create the reality-based community, and that's what we're defending now. That's what you're defending at yeah. Fire. Essentially institutions. Greg, I know you're a big fan of this book. Mm -hmm. uh, you were one of the early readers of it. Jonathan uh, gives you a shout out mm -hmm. at the end. What most stuck out to you about the book, I, and I, I, I kind of want to ask too about your thought about institutions and how they play into here, because I know you're also very into, what was it, Martin Gurry's book? Yeah, Revolt uh, of the Public. Yeah, Revolt of the Public. So, you know, what what are your thoughts? Why do you find this book so important? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, I've been very clear about this. I think it's the most important book of 2021. And he's got the hard copy version. Um, yeah, so. I, got, <laughs> I, got, I got the hard copy. I, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I'm such a huge fan of Kindly Inquisitors, um, mm -hmm. and this this feels like a follow-up, but it takes it kind of to the next level. It also does a great thing of combining some of the best practices of sort of popular nonfiction by connecting it in an entertaining way to um, to what's currently going on, but also is intellectually extremely deep. Mm -hmm. And I think just the whole, people really underestimate how difficult it is to know the world as it simply is, mm -hmm. as it actually is. Um, and that's one of the things that I, I thought reconceptualizing you know, the Enlightenment as the, I don't know who came up with this term, but Yuval Harari writes about it in Homo mm -hmm. and, and Sapiens, um, the discovery of ignorance, that essentially that was actually the revolution, was realizing that our intuitions are wrong. When we start testing things, the world looks nothing like we actually thought. And what we're currently seeing at the moment, um, uh, at all over the political spectrum, are people who are putting, uh, are insisting that their preferences, you know, be true. Uh, and it's really dangerous when it comes from the right. And what I'm seeing in you know, journalism and academia, they're not understanding what they're messing with. If they try to make academia more activist or make journalism more activist, the end result is people won't trust those epistemic institutions. Mm -hmm. And in situations where you don't trust epistemic institutions, that's where you get you know, explosions. It, not that you don't have these under other circumstances, but you get the explosions of hoaxes and conspiracy theories and all sorts of stuff. And I think that you know, John is shining a light on how sophisticated the arduous process of knowing the world that simply is actually is and how essential it is to our society. So I, I think this is, like I said, this is extraordinary. When you talk book. about the corrosion of institutions, you mentioned Kindly Inquisitors, yeah. and, and Jonathan, one of the first questions I had when starting to read this book was, this reads a lot like Kindly Inquisitors, and then you get on and you, you realize how it's different. You write in the book, over the years I came to believe that the framework of Kindly Inquisitors could be strengthened by paying more, paying more attention to the institutional and communitarian foundations of collective inquiry. Greg, to get back to what you were saying about institutions and the lack of trust in institutions, have we seen any of that in COVID, and how has that affected the constitution of knowledge, at least within medicine. Oh, I think it's been a terrible year for trust in experts. Um, I think that, you know, I talk about the different sort of uh, rhetorical fortresses that people have, and I think that there's like one that comes out of academia that I've dubbed the perfect rhetorical fortress. And I think the conservative um, equivalent of that is something I call the efficient rhetorical fortress, which mm -hmm. basically just means you're off the hook for, you don't have to listen to liberals, you don't have to listen to um, experts, and you don't have to listen to, um, is it, uh, to journalists. Mm -hmm. and Bravo! You've you've gotten to eighty five percent of everything you actually you actually need to know. But the thing that makes my job harder when I advocate for these these kind of things is when uh, the experts start believing that they can lie to people for their own good. And we you saw a fair amount about the, uh, about this during COVID, at least the best I could tell. Where you know at first with the mask thing, saying yep. that masks don't actually protect you or anybody else because they were trying, but we desperately need them for nurses and doctors. That was, in my opinion, a disaster for expertise because what they should have, they should have just been straight with people. Like, listen, we're trying to keep these. Um, they are effective, but please, you know, keep these for our doctors. Mm -hmm. Trying to lie for their own good was a bad mistake. Then, of course, you know, uh, Megan McArdle pointed this out. Uh, to, to, uh, not, she's Washington not Post columnist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, and it, it, and I think a lot of other people made this observ observation. Having experts, you know, doctors come out and say, you know, you should avoid COVID and you should avoid crowded places except for. Uh, Black Lives Matters protest was like no, that's <laughs> that's that's undermining your own credibility. Like every time it, it, uh, this this happens, um, people you start adding to the um, uh, the accuracy of being skeptical of experts and all this kind of stuff. And I think we erode that trust to our great great peril. Yeah, and we kind of see that in the due process conversation on campus, right? You know, you look, you see these activists trying to take shortcuts around the fact finding process, which is you know to discover the truth of any allegation. Uh, 
And as a result, people just lo lose trust in the process because yeah. they think the results are foreordained. Jonathan, the Constitution of Knowledge is a comparison of sorts to the United States Constitution, right? Not of sorts. <laughs> you spent a lot of time it's very comparing direct. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not just a metaphor. It's not just a simile. It's, it's actually a lot of very direct parallels in how both of these constitutions, the ones written and ones not, organize social cooperation and negotiation in a non-coercive, constructive way, which is incredibly hard to do. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, that's the question is, that's is it, how yeah. are they similar? And, and you know, I'm thinking they, they kind of came up at the same time. We think about the liberal systems and you know, liberal yeah. science. We go back to kindly inquisitors. You think about how we organize our truth-finding processes through the constitution of knowledge. You think about capital, market capitalism, and then you think about democracy. The I big mean, three. That's yeah. Right, yeah, and all of them came up in the Enlightenment, right? And they're, and they're all grounded in the same fantastically profound, important, but also counterintuitive and hard to defend proposition, which is that the safest, most efficient, and most reliable way to make social decisions is to put no one in particular in charge, mm -hmm. to outsource them to these networks of impersonal rules. So that's what we do with markets, where we have um, lots of exchange going on. There's lots of institutions in there in the middle. It's also what we do with politics. No one person's in a position to run the whole government. Uh, at least not for more than short stretches. They've and this is to, to the eliminate biases, right? Yeah, and it's also to make sure that no one faction can mm -hmm. seize control. Mm -hmm. uh, the typical way of, so every society, small or large, has to deal with um, disagreement. Mm -hmm. And they have to deal with reality. They have to figure out how to come to some sort of account as a society of what's true and what's false. Not on every little thing, but, you know, even a tribal society has to, they're, they're going to come to common beliefs, for example, about religious practices, about how they're going to deal with the weather, migration, all kinds of things like that. Mm -hmm. And it's important for them to stay moored for reality, but that's hard to do mm -hmm. because human beings look to each other to decide what to believe, and that leads to distortions. And we look for beliefs that confirm our biases, that confirm our identities, and that support our standing in the group. And that can lead whole societies into rabbit holes of unreality, and then they split into sects, and then the sects go to war, mm -hmm. and they settle disputes about reality by going to war. That was the Thirty Years' War. Uh -huh. About maybe a third of the population of Germany might have been killed. Or they go to authoritarianism, the standard way of doing it, which is some authority, a priest or a pope or a prince decides what's true. Mm -hmm. So the liberal revolution, and what you guys, and we are all defending in fire, is a very different way of doing it. It's saying, well, wait a minute, let's create a set of impersonal rules in which no one has special advantages and no one has coercive power. And then you guys are all going to have to persuade each other. In politics, it means you're going to have to compromise to get stuff done, whether you like it or not. But that'll be a dynamic force because the compromise process will introduce new ideas and new players and actually better solutions than either side would have had. Same with knowledge. If I, want, if I have a proposition and I want to get it taught in the textbooks, get it established. I'm going to have to get it published. It's going to go through multiple levels of review. I'll have to persuade people around the world in a variety of disciplines. And only after it's been through that process does it get in the textbook. And that's what fire is defending. Mm -hmm. um, well, the attackers on it, you would think, and you know, I'm sure I attack the Constitution of Knowledge with my biases all the time, but you would think just from a pure self-preservation standpoint, that if you use the constitution and knowledge to determine action uh, at some point in the chain, that you, you would see more support for it because it makes your life better, it makes your life easier, or is there something about applying the constitution to knowledge to large groups and societies? For example, I think in the book you use, if you unmoor, unmoor yourself from truth or from knowledge, in the savanna, you might get eaten by a lion or something, right? Like the, the connection between discovering where the lion is and getting eaten by it is, there's a lot of skin in the game, right? Yeah. There's less skin in the game, perhaps, in when you're thinking about whether to believe this or that piece of journalism or the CDC. Um, but at the same time, not believing them seems to have significant consequences, although they might be two or three steps removed. It might be the well, burgeoning of a global yeah, pandemic that yeah. then gets back so to the So that's the problem. This has been called the epistemic tragedy of the commons. Sorry, lots of jargon thrown <laughs> I know, I know Greg doesn't mind. Mm -hmm. But suppose I decide to believe in QAnon. 
uh -huh. that will, apart from the friends I might lose, um, that will have no particularly negative impact on my life because it doesn't really matter if I think that Hillary Clinton is leading a pedophile ring of, of Democrats and maybe Jews that are kidnapping and killing children. Mm -hmm. um, I'll believe that. But if that's good for my ego or if it lets me feel like I'm, I'm initiated into some network of people who know better or it's getting me new friends online, I'm feeling an improvement in my life. Not a mm. disimprovement. I mean, this is way more fun and way more um, energizing and motivating than believing difficult stuff that's really complicated about politics. The problem is if a lot of people make that same self-oriented decision and start going down epistemic rabbit holes, societies begin to break apart, they lose touch with reality, and you get into a world where 75% of Republicans believe completely falsely completely falsely that the election was stolen in 2020. And that is a direct threat. That's an epistemic threat to maintaining our political order. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that scares the hell out of me. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and here's this. So I mentioned the first big lesson of the book is it's not just a marketplace of ideas. It's a constitution of knowledge. Here's the second. You're being manipulated. What's going on here is not just people kind of wandering off the reservation. Uh, it's not just a generalized sort of environmental reduction of faith in institutions, something I, I, don't, I don't know that Guri and others are well enough aware of. This is a deliberate, systematic, very sophisticated disinformation attack mm -hmm. on the institutions, norms, and practices that keep us more to reality. This is Donald Trump mm -hmm. and his allies and people in cancel culture, especially on campus, the people you are dealing with, these are activists. They're operating in an organized, sophisticated way to deliberately unmoor us from reality for political gain. Because mm -hmm. once you detach people from the reality, ask a Soviet propagandist, mm -hmm. you open them to demagoguery, to deceit, they become cynical, they become demoralized, demobilized, all of these things that make it easier to control the political environment. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing now. This yeah. is not happening accidentally. This is a uh Peter Pomerantsev's yeah. Nothing is True But Everything is Possible, yeah. and I, I know you interview him in the book, but... I have to read. Yeah. He, I mean, he's and fantastic, and that book was written before 2016. You write that old-style censorship is expensive and efficient and leaky, especially in open society like America. Suppose instead of smothering unwelcome ideas, you swamp and swarm them. Essentially, you cover them in shit. Yeah. It's called the fire hose of falsehood. It's mm -hmm. a tactic that the Russians have perfected. Um, I believe hey, it, not all Russians. <laughs> not all. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Donald Trump, I believe, is the greatest propaganda innovator since maybe Goebbels. I think he's of that stature. People say, well, you know, the guy's a buffoon. Thank goodness he couldn't really do much. In the realm of information warfare, he's better than Putin because mm. he figured out how to take these Russian-style propaganda tactics like as his aide Stephen Bannon said, flooding the zone with shit, mm -hmm. just drowning out good information by swamping it with lies. Mm -hmm. In his 2016 campaign, PolitiFact found that 70% of his checkable claims were false. Mm -hmm. Think about that. 70% of what the guy was saying was false. That's the, not like trying to persuade people of particular lies. That's swamping them in so much bullshit that they won't know which end is up. But my conservative friends would respond, and perhaps this proves your point, that politic fact is just a liberal left-wing uh, fact checker employed by Facebook to censor them on social media. And that's exactly the goal. Yeah. Create cynicism, mistrust, make people think that mainstream media is just another racket. So the only person you can trust is Donald Trump, as he will tell you. Mm -hmm. Greg, it sounds like you have a thought. Oh, no, no. I'm just, I, I, I remember it was something like PolitiFact got something horribly wrong, though, and it got me so sad because I'm kind of like, even the checkers, you know, n n need checking. It, of course. It, it just seems to be, it, it's, it seems there's, there's so much giving up going on on, on, both, on both sides, on both extremes, you know, at, at the moment. Um, giving it, up meaning? Giving up on truth. Um, giving up on the idea that truth really matters. It's about political motivation. And I mean, honestly, this also ties in coddling the American mind, you know, about mm -hmm. what, yeah, sure. what, where I feel Believe like the... Believe it if it feels good. Believe well, it if it... Or if they think it's going to be politically useful. Like one of the things that I actually uh, have moved to being kind of open about the fact that it actually makes me angry, that if we know this many students are coming in already anxious and depressed, the idea that we would fill their heads with an ideology that's essentially hopeless, but the goal is to get them to act in a particular political way more than anything else is 
cruel. Um, and it, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty overwhelmed by the changes that we've seen just in the last 10 years and at the moment not feeling super optimistic. What, what's your, what's, what do you think the long term? Well, looks just like? a, a small point is I want to make a defense of PolitiFact. Mm -hmm. Um, the Washington Post fact-checking team, yeah, of course they get some wrong, they will infuriate you, but, but notice, the reason they're infuriating you is that they spell it out, mm. and they show their work, yeah. and they tell you what their sources are, and put you in a position to say, that's the totally wrong conclusion. Yeah. Everything there is not made up, unmoored from reality, the citations are going to be real, and mm. it's like, you know, you read a bad academic paper, <laughs> but if it's playing by the rules, it won't be using fake data. Yep. Yeah. And that's the distinction here. You can disagree with PolitiFact, and you mm -hmm. can say they got that one wrong, and journalists get it wrong all the time. But, but the key to the reality-based community, the great innovation that put this vaccine in my arm a month ago so I can be sitting here in this room with you, mm -hmm. is not that it doesn't make mistakes. It's that it makes them incredibly quickly. Mm -hmm. And then it corrects them incredibly quickly. And it does that by making sure that the price of being wrong is not that you lose your job mm -hmm. or your reputation, or your life. Mm -hmm. It's that you lose the argument and we all move on. So this brings us to where what you were talking about and, and what I think is the core of FIRE's mission and maybe, if, if I may, Nico, what I think is the most directly relevant part of the book to what you guys are doing, which is the only way this error correcting mechanism works inside or outside of academia is if you have lots of viewpoint diversity. You've got to have pluralism because we can't see our biases. And if we only talk to other people who share our biases, all we'll get is a distortion of reality. We'll just be in an echo chamber confirming each other. Mm -hmm. So what do you do if you want to disrupt the scientific process in ways that steer it politically, that dominate politically? Well, it turns out you can game the environment by coercing people socially. Mm -hmm. If they're afraid, if one whole side of the argument is afraid to speak up or one whole side of the argument isn't even represented in a particular, say, department on campus, you're going to get a distorted, manipulated reality in which only one side will be heard and that side will be able to dominate politically and that will be their goal. Mm -hmm. And I, I worry, as you see in the book, I worry a lot about that environment increasingly growing on campus. And that's why I think FIRE's work, you know, you think of yourselves as you should as a free speech group, mm -hmm. as a liberty-based organization. You guys are also a science organization. You are defending the norms and practices that make it possible to gather knowledge and that give the university credibility mm -hmm. in seeking knowledge by defending intellectual pluralism and by trying to keep the dialogue open and prevent this kind of information warfare, this kind of dominance. Yeah, yeah, I think you're kind of tipping your hat to the idea of cancel culture yeah. there. Yeah. The idea of cancel culture <laughs> really entered the public consciousness in the summer of 2020 last year, yeah. though it existed long before that. John Ronson had written his book, we dressed it in Can We Take a Joke, the movie. Yeah. Um, and a bulk of the last half of your book deals with cancel culture. And if I'm reading the book correctly, you started the book in 2018, mm -hmm. correct? Was, was cancel culture always something you kind of wanted to fit, fit into the argument, or did you just see the trend emerging and think this is yeah, a threat? I saw the trend emerging. And we didn't have the word cancel culture when I started this book. We had call-out culture, which yeah. is how John Haidt used to refer to it. Yeah. And even that was new. I kind of had to write it in as I was going along. So, yeah, it, it came up gradually. Um, so uh, the insight of this book that I think is new and, and might be helpful is to understand that what we call cancel culture Although it's not new, it's in fact very old, it's an age-old form of propaganda, yeah. it's now operating at a much higher level of capacity than it did in the past because of social media, mm -hmm. which make it much more efficient. But we need to think about it as not just random people being mean to each other online, or not just a bunch of, I don't know, extreme activists who are acting out we need to think of this as targeted information warfare. It's about per groups with particular ideologies on campus and off using social coercion to manipulate the environment so that a lot of people are afraid to speak out. Mm -hmm. So it turns out you can create what's called a spiral of silence on campus. You see this all the time. Uh, people who, for example, think affirmative action or counterproductive are very reluctant to talk about that. But that means other people who think the same thing assume that they're isolated 
they become silent themselves. So you create this cascade, this spiral of silence, where one group, was in, which is in fact a minority on campus, actually, in mm -hmm. many cases, is able to dominate as if everyone agreed with them. That's what they're aiming for, and they're doing it on purpose. This is like the emperor has no clothes idea. Yeah, spiral silence. yeah. It's, it's very sophisticated. It's not new. Tocqueville in the 1830s came to America and said the biggest threat to democracy is people become afraid to speak out once they see the direction of public opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, John Stuart Mill mm -hmm. warned against it in 1859. He said that, amazes me, but Mill said the biggest threat to liberty in England at that time was not from the government, it was from enforced social conformity mm -hmm. that made the person of genius, the eccentric, the person with the really out of the box view, reluctant to pursue that or to voice that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and actually, of course, in the very famous uh, 15th anniversary speech by Steve Pinker, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. he talks about pluralistic ignorance. Um, and yeah, it, it's amazing how much we sort of depend on weirdo weirdos and oddballs, and we can sort of like sing hymns to them later on, at the same time trying to cancel the ones that yeah, are actually or just in our midst. dissidents, even if they're not weird. You know, there's, there's nothing weird, for example, about, about arguing that, I don't know, take, take any controversial proposition on mm -hmm. campus, that maybe black-on-black -black crime is a bigger problem than white-on-black crime, mm -hmm. or that mm -hmm. police shootings are not, that all, not all that important. I mean, believe that, disbelieve that um, as you like, but am I right to think that those propositions would be very hard to discuss mm -hmm. on most major, at least, at least elite American universities, and that that's lopping off a whole part of the conversation, which yeah. you have to be able to have in order to understand where the problem is that you need to solve. I think it depends on the campus, um, but that's one of the reasons why we're really stepping up our data collection. And so far it has, um, uh, to, to a degree, confirmed what, what we've experienced, is that these kind of like heavy ideological presumptions against arguments are the strongest at the most elite schools. Uh, are they everywhere or only at the elite school? Oh, they're everywhere. They're just, it's just a question of degree. Um, but when I go to like a working class school where, or where most people don't come from, from elite backgrounds, it tends to be a better environment for arguing. And if I'm right to understand what you've been saying recently, mm -hmm. and, and certainly what my interviews and research for the book confirm, it's that the source of, of this pressure has morphed from kind of official repression in the form of speech codes, so mm -hmm. those are still there in many cases, to unofficial repression in the form of peer pressure, ostracism, damage to reputation, worries about getting investigated, yeah. worries about generating complaints among students. Is that right? Um, I would say it's, it's both. Um, and because what we saw, what led to calling the American Mind was just watching this hit campus like a, like a lightning bolt. Like, and, and it was just right at the end of 2013 through 2014. We just saw this, suddenly the students who were the best on free speech were suddenly the worst on free speech. And they were going after their fellow students. But it ends up being complemented by the administration who has the bias related incident programs and all the stuff and sometimes will actually encourage you know, student activism yeah. only in one direction. So it ends up creating this kind of... And the student activists figure out how to game the system in order to start investigations or threaten mm -hmm. them or use teacher evaluations. Yeah. And then why bother? And they realize that saying I've been traumatized sets off a whole chain of consequences. And then right on cue, 2018, four years later, we begin to see it in the culture outside the university. Yep. Is that the story? That's the way, the way it seems to be working out. And it's funny, because Haidt and I were just kind of like, no, no, people, people keep on, kept on saying that these elite students were going to graduate and the real world would change them. We're like, no, 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 no. They're going to change the real world. Um, and so far, unfortunately, from what we're hearing from uh, yeah, different corporations. I, I did corporations, not see that coming. I thought the real world would kick their ass. I think in some cases it is, but in companies that are that, that are so reliant on elite institutions that they end up having sort of a critical mass of people from some of these particular schools, it ends up being dysfunctional. I mean, so much so that Saturday Night Live has e e even managed to make fun of it, but let's see how long that lasts. It's a yeah. famous Star Trek <laughs> It's a famous Star Trek Well, is, is the reason the real world hasn't kicked their ass, so to speak, because <laughs> they've hijacked the language and, and weaponized it in a way that prevents advocates of the Constitution of Knowledge or makes them uncomfortable advocating for the Constitution of Knowledge. For example, arguments towards racism, sexism, or other bigotry. You hate to be accused of that, and as soon as you're arguing that you're not, you're losing. You're, on, you're arguing from your heels. The other is the medicalization yeah. um, language. The, you know, as you said, Jonathan, you know, this, this language is traumatizing. You point to the New York Times who published the Tom Cotton op-ed, and I forget how 
the New York Times staffers responded and you said it made them unsafe unsafe how do you even respond how do you advocate for the Constitution of knowledge if the results of the Constitution of knowledge quote unquote are making people unsafe which of course uh, the reality based community is about being unsafe because new ideas mm -hmm. are always threatening and challenging yeah. so yeah it's both of those things I mean you guys have a probably a better feel than I do for what's going on here but but yeah number one um, a lot of these attacks, let, let's, let's give folks credit. The, the activists on campus are not snowflakes. Mm -hmm. They're impassioned people who are making arguments that come from well-intentioned places, yep. including anti-racism, I think, which is something we all support. Mm -hmm. We may disagree about how to define it, but that's not something any of us want to be on the wrong side of. We want to pursue that social goal. And then the second thing is the culture we're in now, we don't like making people feel upset. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gay. I can tell you that, that there's you know, a very serious downside to being in a world where people believe things that are false and harmful about you, and you ingest that as a child. I, you know, I, that's the whole story of my life. So those two things are very compelling. And then there's a third thing, which is really important. And, and this is where I think FIRE's work, and especially its upcoming work, is going to be so important which is you can't overemphasize that one side of this argument came on very quickly and took everyone else by surprise. Mm -hmm. No one was prepared for this. They were all dismissing it or not taking it seriously. What do you, when you say one side of the argument, what do you mean? The tactics used by I, I'm saying that the pluralistic liberals, mm -hmm. the people who want to defend free speech and especially intellectual pluralism, and both the right and the positive need for people to, to say things that are outside the box mm -hmm. and controversial. Those people weren't ready for any of this. They weren't organized. Uh, FIRE was doing important work on campus, but you know there wasn't a whole lot outside of that. Mm -hmm. Most people focused on, on the First Amendment and legal defenses. So I'm not sure people saw coming that there was gonna be a major, um, a major kind of focused targeted campaign trying to shut down whole aspects of the debate. Um, and what I'm seeing now is, is the beginnings of a counter-mobilization. I'm seeing the beginning of liberals, smaller liberals, people who believe in, in pluralism, diversity of ideas, toleration, even if that upsets people. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing them start to organize and fight back in a way that we've never seen before. I think they've finally tumbled to the fact that, that this attack is coming from what I call purists. Mm -hmm. They're people who only want to tolerate and accept one viewpoint, their own, mm -hmm. and they've come to see that that's incompatible with the liberal order, um, not just incidentally, but, but fundamentally. And I think they're starting to understand that there's also kind of this weird neo-Marxist structure mm -hmm. going on here, you know, this notion of a kind of eternal, uh, endless revolution. Mm -hmm. And as that happens, you can see they're starting to figure out how to organize groups and ideas that are, I think, going to, to come to the defense. But it, it takes a lot of time yeah. to counter-organize. Well, in your book, your response to this is to speak up. It's, it's, it's almost simple in its conception. It says, you argue that if it applies to anyone, the term snowflake more aptly describes people who profess to support intellectual freedom and diversity, but fail to speak up for it, especially tenured professors whose mm -hmm. jobs are among the safest yet who often dive under the furniture when academic freedom is <laughs> so challenged. So true, and so one of the great disappointments of my career was seeing how few tenured professors actually bother to stick up for their friends or for their students. There are some real big exceptions, though, of course. People like Alan Charles Kors, who mm -hmm. co-founded FIRE, Donald or Donald, da oh, Donald Downs. Donald Downs is the recovering from... living form. Uh -huh. uh, Donald Downs, by the way, just um, he's, he's a free speech hero that everybody in the free speech uh, movement actually knows. He's recovering from double uh, lung, uh, a double lung transplant, like yeah. really serious surgery, but so far he's doing okay. He was just on the podcast in February or in yeah. early March. But Robbie George, you know Keith Whittington, all, the, 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 you know Nadine Strassner, of course. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of uh, people who are exceptions, but it has been disappointing how little use so many professors make of the safest job in the world. And, and one of the surest ways to defend yourself against canceling, it seems, and you kind of hint to this in the book, is to just not apologize, to not give in. Uh, you say by hardening their defenses, organizations make themselves more resilient if hit by cancelers and therefore less tempting as targets. You've seen this with some presidents at universities. Camille yeah, Paglia yeah. at the University of the Arts, for example. Mark Hamilton at the University of Alaska. Uh, President just, Zimmer at Chicago, President yeah. Daniels at Purdue. Yeah, leadership at the top 
really matters. Really matters because that's able to say, we'll have your back. Mm -hmm. if just because you offend a student doesn't mean you're going to be investigated for losing your job. But, but the, Nico, to me, the moral of the story is you have to work both sides of the equation at once. Um, remember, the point of um, information warfare is to demoralize and demobilize the other side. Mm -hmm. Again and again, I talk to professors who, who would say something like, well, look, I don't like what's going on. I'm having to change the way I teach because I'm frightened of my students. But there's nothing I can do about it as an individual. I don't want to get investigated. And I know mm -hmm. that if I'm just one voice, I'll be demolished. Mm -hmm. So they don't speak out. Of course, everyone else makes the same calculation. And you're back to what we talked to before, the spiral of silence. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the intimidated environment, which is what the activists are speaking. So you have to do two things. First, you have to say to that professor, you can make a difference. Sakharov made a difference. In mm -hmm. fact, he played a key role in bringing down the Soviet empire because what does disrupt a disinformation campaign, a spiral of silence, is when it hits that anchor in reality that says, no, 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 facts, 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 truth, truth, truth. Here's the evidence, and I'm not shutting up. But just as important, you have to make it worth that professor's while by providing group support. Mm -hmm. They have to have resources to file a lawsuit. That can be fire. They need cultural resources. They need support groups. They need other people like Keith Whittington and I think the Academic Freedom Alliance are going to do this. Mm -hmm. Coming to them and saying, we're a community. We share your values. How can we help? Mm -hmm. um, you're going to need all kinds of institutional resources so that people can organize. And only after they're organized and counter-mobilized can you fight this disinformation campaign. Remember, it is, it is a campaign. Mm -hmm. It is coordinated. It is a front, not just an individual that you're fighting. And you have to organize against it. And you think the liberal system, the constitution of knowledge, is a sufficient weapon to defeat the, the disinformation campaign? Or is it, as people have described democracy or other liberal systems, a suicide pact? It's as soon as it's the adversaries it. you know, figure out how to hack it, so to speak, you're, yeah, bringing, you're uh, bringing a knife to a gunfight. What a gun great fight. question, because that's really the question that the book ends with. Um, we have, this is not the first major information warfare attack or disruption in the Constitution of Knowledge. In fact, the first big information disruption was before John Locke, it was the invention of movable type. Mm -hmm. And that was used immediately to put out fake news about witches, which led to the, to the murders of tens of thousands of people across Europe. And people fretted at the time. We can't even have an organized society with the printing press because mm -hmm. there's so much wild stuff out there, so many conspiracy theories and fake news, led to a war across Europe. So we have faced disruptions in the past. Um, in general, the way we face them down has been you build new institutions and norms or you adapt old ones so that people start to understand what the challenge is and how someone like us should react in that situation so that it's not just up to the individual. Like we turn journalism into a fact-based, a reality-based um, community by saying, okay, it's not just me. People like us, professional journalists, we're going to run a correction if we're wrong. If I write something about Nico Perino mm -hmm. and it's wrong, uh, well, I'm going to call him up before mm -hmm. I put it in. So you develop But the hack there is that, as Greg said, you know, like PolitiFact, they get one thing wrong, people see they get it wrong, then the whole system is discredited, right? Well, I don't think the whole system is discredited. But that's, that's what they time, will say. They're getting, that, that is what they'll say. Mm -hmm. um, and the point is you need to counter that in systematic ways. So to, to go back to your question, Sorry to be so roundabout, but no. to go back to the point you're making, I don't think we know yet if we rise to this challenge. We haven't talked about digital media, huge challenge because Yeah, I'm going to get to that. I have some questions. Yeah. Uh, that's a huge challenge. Cancel culture is, is very effective and very well organized. Disinformation is weaponized by Trump. All of these things are really tough. And whether we fight back effectively depends on do we understand the nature of the attacks? And do we begin to counter-organize so that we can respond effectively and regain people's trust? Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of it is on people like me in journalism. And a lot of it is on people in academia. Greg referred to this, to understand that they are badly damaging the reputations of their institutions when they allow themselves to become politicized and one-sided. Yeah. And that, that's a shift I've seen in my own career um, is 
you know, um, it used to be, uh, my entire career, the, the public relations office has gone after professors who say obnoxious things or things that, that, that don't look, the university look good. Um, sad but true, been, been true as long as there, there have been colleges. Um, in other cases, the lawyers will contact them saying, oh, um, you know, this might be a Title IX violation even if it's wildly not. We had those fights forever. It was only around 2013 that we started seeing, you know, the students really getting in the act and people saying they're afraid of their own students. Um, then you start having the right, uh, you know, mobilized also coming after them on, on, on Facebook and Twitter. That, that blew up around 2014 as well. And the, the, but the thing that I've seen that really, frankly, frightens me is the actual occasional, doesn't happen all that often, but the occasional withdrawal of academic papers um, it, oh, it, yeah. it, it, in the face of anger. Now, the um, Rebecca Tuvel story it, it has a happy ending, that they didn't actually pull back didn't her. Back I didn't know down. she became the chair of her department. Yeah. You have that in your book. And we need yeah. more of that because, like, because if you're looking at a if you're looking at an epistemic system where you know you're suspicious that everything's stacked in one direction, but it also turns out that if you dissent, you will get canceled yeah. for it, or your your paper will get withdrawn. That's bad. <laughs> Just so people know what what Greg is referring to, this is a professor who came under attack. She's a philosopher. She wrote a perfectly good paper. It involved trans issues. Some people decided to go to to war to make an example of her. That's how information warfare works. You go after vulnerable individuals and that suppresses, that chills speech in a whole class. Uh, and they, among other things, demanded that the paper be retracted, although there was nothing wrong with it. And mm -hmm. in that case, the journal said, no, that's not how it works. Uh, we retract things because they're fraudulent or because of ethical violations, but we don't retract things because some people don't like the message. Mm -hmm. Um, and those instances are super important. And, and there are others. You know, I'm talking a little too abstractly. But, but for example, Purdue University now is in its fifth year of including a First Amendment module, a free speech module, in its freshman orientation. Mm -hmm. And that's important because that prepares students as they come in the door for the kind of environment they'll have in college. And they'll understand that, yeah, there's a right to be offensive at Purdue, a public university, and at the United States. And amazingly, a lot of students just don't know that. Well, we, we can't defend what we don't, don't know even exists. Does there need to be a constitution of knowledge or liberal science module? Because My it, book should be adopted by every <laughs> freshman course in the country. By law. By I, law. I, 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 I ask that kind of in seriousness, because yeah. I'm thinking about when I went to college, uh -huh. no one talked to me about the system that produces knowledge or the purpose even of a university. You know, I got... My to be clear, we're not serious about it being required by law, but, but, but the idea of this being introduced in <laughs> yeah, orientation this as a sophisticated concept, not just yeah. as a legalistic concept, absolutely. Well, that's the goal of the book. When I set out to write this book, it was not just for my understanding. It's, so, so here's the thing, Nico. The constitution of knowledge is by far the most benign um, and powerful social system in the history of humanity. This has transformed our species from a group of small tribes or maybe religious sects, each with a separate truth, none of which is particularly well attached to reality, into a species that has a species-wide network that's finding knowledge at a fantastic rate and expanding exponentially. The number of papers on COVID-19 went from zero in January of last year it was doubling every two weeks through August. Wow. This is the rate at which this global system is able to make mistakes, find mistakes, turn that into knowledge, and then turn that into good stuff. Yeah. So, but, but it's so successful. When a system is that successful over that long a period of time, people take it for granted. Mm. They think, well, it's just going to happen automatically no matter what we do. We'll have a marketplace of ideas. We'll have free speech, and the rest will take care of itself. And the point is that's not true. It's, it's like the US Constitution. People need to understand how all this stuff works, you know, checks and balances, Congress, courts, where laws come from, why it's important to have rotation in office, even if your side loses. Same thing with the Constitution of Knowledge. People need to understand why it's important to have dispassionate fact checking, why it's so important not to have truthiness, not to mm -hmm. be believing and teaching stuff just because you think it should be right. What's wrong with the idea of safetyism? Your book is about this, but when you start to believe that some ideas are so dangerous that you can't voice them or so traumatizing, you lose the ability to understand reality. Yeah. Well, the other problem with the, that sort of language is you can't falsify it. You almost have to take it at someone's 
word, right? Because it, it ends the whole debate, right? Yeah. Because having it's a, a nuclear conversation is traumatizing, and that's what it's designed to do. To, mm -hmm. So you, so the point of this book is to say, hey, wait a minute, look at all of these things that we need to understand if we're going to defend the culture that we rely on. Mm -hmm. The um, surface it, make it visible. Your, guess, your, your point about the power, the benignness of the Constitution, but also the power of it. It's, it's the COVID example is great, right? I mean, it, especially when the Constitution yeah. of Knowledge, science the brings itself. based community, I mean, incredible. This is where the I The New York of, Times published a piece that predicted that the vaccine wouldn't be ready for 10 years, and it was being put in people's and, arms. And that was, well, that was based on science. Yeah. soundly yeah. Yeah. on previous examples. So where I, I kind of disagree with something Greg said earlier, maybe with not that. disagree, but it's a different emphasis. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's happened out of COVID is people have looked around and say, oh, wait a minute. Science is actually good. Mm -hmm. Reality is actually good. Uh, these institutions performed extremely well. And yeah, there were mistakes about masks. Mm -hmm. I disagree with you that it was lying. Mm -hmm. I, I think in the early days, people didn't understand that the disease was contagious mm -hmm. before it had symptoms. So they said, no, you don't need a mask. You just stay home when you get sick, mm -hmm. like flu. So they got it wrong. Mm -hmm. But I think the bigger lesson here is the fantastic performance. I mean, they had they had the genetic code of this virus within a weekend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the first vaccine was designed in what, about 10 days? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, as I say, this is species transformed. And, and that's exactly what I hope happened. Um, I'm, I'm worried that we actually have had a bigger, a, a, a bigger crisis of expertise, you know, as Martin Gurry put it. So it's interesting because like you kind of disagree with them to, to, to uh, Gurry um, as this being, uh, th this epistemic crisis as being organic, you know, just kind of coming out of a million new voices on the, uh, on the scene. And you're, you're talking about the intentional yeah. uh, plot. I mean, both, both are true yeah. and they interact, but yeah, the system's being manipulated. That too, yeah. Yeah, I mean, take Trump. Mm -hmm. People say, well, you know, he's a bozo. He doesn't know what he's doing. He spent the last 30 years, he's built his career on manipulating the information environment. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a guy who would get on the phone and pretend to be someone else in order to manipulate the media. This is a guy who learned the art of, of what, what did he call it? Um, um, truthful hyperbole. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know that one. But. I think that's from, uh, or maybe you didn't even say truthful. But, um, <laughs> I can't remember the phrase, but it's in the art of the deal. Mm -hmm. This is someone whose entire career is based on creating illusions, mm -hmm. manipulating the media, um, using intimidation tactics to silence or isolate people who he doesn't want to be heard from. It's no surprise when he comes into office mm -hmm. and then weaponizes those things on an unprecedented scale and then turns an entire political party into what amounts to a propaganda organ. So I think it's wrong just to say, well, the internet came along and, uh, and it shattered old institutions. There is an element of that, mm -hmm. but it's, if we're going to defend the system, mm -hmm. constitution of knowledge, it is important to understand it has very real and very potent enemies. Mm -hmm. And those people are working every day. Rush Limbaugh, okay, he's been on the radio 30 years. His big constant gig has been attacking day after day the institutions that we rely on to make knowledge. He talks about the four corners, the four pillars of deceit, mm -hmm. and that's science, academia, journalism, and government. He's on the radio every day saying, you can't trust them. They're all out to deceive you. Only trust me. Well, that's going to have an effect, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So... Got to stay focused on that. You talk about the attacks here. You, you write in the book that one is predominantly right-wing and populist. The other is predominantly left-wing and elitist. One employs chaos and confusion. The other conformity and social coercion. We've talked about this. We've talked about the disinformation campaigns on the right. And we've talked about cancel culture and call-out culture on the right. Both, and this is where we'll get to digital media, seem to me to be supercharged by the digital media environment in particular social media, but I was kind of surprised at the end of your book. You don't say it outright, but you seem to be more open to social media companies moderating content. Oh, yeah. Something, no, I do say that outright. Something others see as censorship. Um, you talk yeah, about... Yeah, you, I don't see it that way. Yeah, you talk earlier about journalism and how it took a while for the constitution of knowledge systems to kind of catch up and formalize it and make it what we know it is today. Is social media the next frontier you write? 
at this writing, perhaps surprisingly, and this is what makes me think that you're supportive of content moderation, at, at this writing, perhaps surprisingly, the organizations working hardest to build institutional barriers to propaganda and intimidation are the ones most often criticized for doing too little, social media companies, or doing too much if you're looking at the right. Figuring out how to moderate oceans of content non-arbitrarily is a Herculean job, but major companies, Facebook, Google, Twitter, are spending millions hiring thousands and innovating to do better. So I, I've put a lot there. Yeah, yeah. I'd be curious to get your views on this. This is one of the few areas where I think Nadine Strassen and I take different views. There's kind of a classic libertarian view in which Facebook, for example, is a public forum and more speech is always better speech and mm -hmm. the less moderation that goes on, the better. And, and I don't take that view, partly because I came up in mainstream journalism. And what we understand is if you turn your newspaper over to your readers, and get rid of all the editors, what you get will be raw sewage. Mm -hmm. You've got to have people in the middle making some decisions about what goes and doesn't goes. And in fact, Facebook does. Mm -hmm. Often they're algorithmic, sometimes they're human, but these are not open markets where absolutely anything goes on. They're making decisions every day about what to present. Mm -hmm. The problem has been that they're making those decisions based on things other than truth value. Mm -hmm. They're making those decisions based on what's going to attract large audiences, and that turns out to be falsehood and outrage. Mm -hmm. And that's always been the case. But also, that's 19th century media in America. Yeah. Um, and, and the only way to get out of that box, if you're Facebook, is the same way everyone gets out of it, mainstream media, science. Mm -hmm. You've got to have some institutional judgments which try to sort truth from falsehood and prefer, um, prefer truth. You don't necessarily need to ban falsehood. That tends to backfire, mm -hmm. and we see that all the time. But you can change your algorithms so that if something is fact-checked, it's going to be higher up. And Google has started to do that. Yeah. You can change your algorithms so that if something is outrageous and false, you know, vaccine denialism, it's lower down. You don't see it on page one. Facebook's content, uh, sorry, Facebook's oversight board, mm -hmm. which a lot of people kind of dismiss as self-serving, I take very seriously mm -hmm. as a big potential step forward because historically, consistently, the way we've dealt with earlier information disruptions and attacks like this is you build institutions that have some legitimacy and credibility to counter them. Mm -hmm. And Facebook is saying, okay, let's try to set up some rules of the road that are fairly consistent and fairly good. And let's set some, you know, let's set a real commission to do that and let's try to bind ourselves. That's exactly what we did when the Royal Society was set up in Isaac Newton's day to try to guide science, create some rules of the road. It's exactly what the American Society of Newspaper Editors did in the 1920s, um, what the um, Association of American University Professors did in the 1920s when they said, hey, let's have some standards for tenure, mm -hmm. academic independence. It's exactly the same thing. And in the past, that has worked. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't work, I'm not sure anything else would work. You say they're basing their algorithms on falsehood and outrage, maybe perhaps what gets the most clicks or anything like that. But I think people would also contend, and this is where you get into the censorship debate, that they're basing their algorithms based on where the largest constituency is that would push back. Uh, you know, for example, you, you put something on Facebook or Twitter, and there are interest groups on the right or the left that is then calling on Facebook and, to and censor. And that's exactly why building institutions and guidelines is so important mm -hmm. because you want to be able to say, okay, well, we're developing some actual codes that people have given it some thought to. Um, and we're even going to follow these codes when it's against our commercial interests is the commitment Mark Zuckerberg has made. Mm -hmm. We'll see if he lives up to it. But he's saying, let's not do it ad hoc mm -hmm. based on politics. And to me, that's a major development. Mm -hmm. Like that's the right idea for how you approach this. Yeah. And honestly, that's one of the things that David French and I have been saying for a long time is that we advocate for First Amendment standards, not because they're First Amendment standards, but because we think they make a lot of sense. And it's something you can appeal to when making some of the decisions about what is and is not protected. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, doesn't mean they have to, but I do think there's a tremendous amount of wisdom that you can glean from First Amendment yeah. law. Yeah, and it, without going all the way to what First Amendment law protects, yeah, I mean, First Amendment protects pornography. It protects crush videos, presumably. Mm -hmm we wouldn't, or a lot of people wouldn't want that on their social media feed. I guess the problem I have, Jonathan, is that they create these standards, and I don't like the standards, just from a normative value, uh, point of view. But you, what you're saying is that even thinking about the standards is the first step. Yeah. 
And no one's always going to like the standards of the outcome. But remember, the core of the Constitution, whether it's the US Constitution or the Constitution of Knowledge or even, even market systems, mm -hmm. you won't always like the outcome. You've mm -hmm. got to believe that the rules are, in some sense, fundamentally legitimate. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to always out, um, like the outcome. And it's very important that not everyone will. Um, back to the point you were making just mm -hmm. now, Greg, I, I want to um, throw in a friendly amendment to mm -hmm. what FIRE is doing. Sure. Because, yeah, you're defending free speech on campus, but in doing that, you're also defending all of these rules and norms. Some are written, mm -hmm. tenure pro uh, protections, uh, plagiarism and abuse protections. Some of them unwritten, mm -hmm. like uh, classroom, uh, like, like free speech on campus that allows for open discourse, challenging discourse, mm -hmm. not letting safetyism interfere with that. Mm -hmm. You're also defending these rules of the road mm -hmm. that make it possible for academia to produce knowledge in a non-politicized way, yeah. right? You're defenders of knowledge, not just free speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, academic freedom, whenever I explain what FIRE does, you know, I say free speech, academic freedom, and there are people who, like Stanley Fish, who actually think these are entirely separate ideas, whereas I think it's kind of like free speech is this giant Boolean circle and academic freedom is this somewhat over overlapping. Um, but in terms of importance, you know, the, the academic freedom part of it, you know, like that's how we know the world as it is. And, 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 and it's... Yeah. And you also make important distinctions, which are easy to forget, like academic freedom and free speech does not include the right for a biology professor to teach creationism as a fact. Yep. And you would never, I assume if someone came to you and said it's a violation of my First Amendment rights, so I'm a medical professor and I want to teach um, Christian science. Yep. Uh, you would not take that case. No, and what's and what's funny about this is one of the reasons why I refer people back to the first to First Amendment law so often is it deals very well. You know, you know, like it, it's not like it's some mechanical machine. Like what, when it actually looks at situations involving actual professors, it's able to make these distinctions and remember that the function of it is to help us understand what the world is. And there's competing levels of academic freedom on institutional, individual, and even to some degree. And it's it's better thought out than people give it credit for. Um, and and all, all, this, all these ideas that actually do, do a better job of producing, a, producing knowledge are kind of baked in. But what I would love to get, um, just, like, just like you said, just like we, we, we discussed before, is priming students when they come in for this being a very noble, very strange, very important endeavor that's no, fundamentally nothing like K through 12. It, it's about being part of the way the world looks at itself. Yeah, and it's not like everyday life. Either. Right. Something I, I make a big deal out of, I fuss about in my book because it's so important, is that we don't con conduct our everyday lives according to the Constitution of Knowledge. I mean, every time we walk into a church or a mm -hmm. synagogue or a mosque, we become part of, a, we're not doing science. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in a community, an epistemic community with certain beliefs, which you know we don't send those out for a lab to be tested or put them in journals and hope that scientists around the world will correct us. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very different world, and so we're not telling students, look, you have to give up all your beliefs and be some kind of Vulcan. But, but we do need to tell students, yes, free speech, you'll hear things that are offensive, and yes, academic rigor. There are going to be certain requirements for what we say is knowledge around here. You can say anything you want, but if you want to say that what you're saying is actually true, mm -hmm. is actually objectively true, we're going to teach you the steps that you have to go through to do that. And you're not allowed to shortcut that by just saying, well, but subjectively, mm -hmm. I think like X or Y is true. Or as a. Or a as of, a, yeah, yeah, that's the classic example. As okay. a gay person, I feel like there's an epidemic of trans violence. Mm -hmm. Well, the numbers show, what, 44 last year in a country with 16 to 19,000 homicides. We can debate whether that's an epidemic, but we have to have that debate. You can't just make the assertion because you feel like it's true, right? Yeah. It's really hard to get people to function that way, but in an academic environment, not a church environment, you you got to do that. Yeah, I'm. A, I mean, as probably maybe not everybody knows this, but I'm actually a political liberal. Um, but doing this for 20 years, it's made me somewhat more sympathetic to to, to the conservative critiques of higher ed. And what would you say to people who just think that the system is kind of rigged against their 
their point of view, given like you mean how conservatives, conservatives, that essentially like how few conservatives there are in so many departments. And that's what about. conservatives have are. You I'm see the about. new new conservatives saying, "Well, we've tried the liberal idea of freedom of speech, even." So, and we, but it, it hasn't worked out. Look I'd like what it's to know what you us. think about well, that. Well, I, but I'm but, talking uh, specifically about higher ed and expertise. Essentially, being when when you have so when when the base rate is so low already, and it actually seems like even if you do dissent, you can potentially get canceled for it. So. Um, I worry about that a lot, and I think conservatives of good faith, not mm -hmm. just you know people who like Rush Limbaugh who are doing propaganda, but conservatives of good faith have a case, and I'm worried about it, but I think they kind of mislocate the problem. Mm -hmm. But you tell me if you think this is right. Mm -hmm. I think people have the idea that there's a kind of higher ed conspiracy of the far left mm -hmm. to politicize the whole thing and turn it into social justice warfare. And I don't really think that's the case. I think most professors and most students are still there to do in good conscience the job that they were trained to do, which is find knowledge in fairly rigorous ways. Mm -hmm. And that more of the problem has to do first with a coterie of activists who are using the tactics we talked about, social coercion, intimidation, silencing, to distort the environment that makes it harder for people of good faith to do that work mm -hmm. and to feel protected doing that work. But second, maybe more important, that in certain disciplines and departments at major universities, there's no longer enough viewpoint diversity mm -hmm. on the faculty so that people are actually testing each other's beliefs. And so it's not a deliberate effort to suppress one side. It's the lack of representation of one side leading to a skewed outcome. Mm -hmm. We also see that increasingly in journalism, I'm sorry to say, at some major outlets. We won't name them right now, but you know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure do. And one of the things the book says is that it's, it's just imperative that the university put a high, as high a premium on viewpoint diversity as on other forms of diversity. There's a lot of discrimination now that's documented against conservatives in hiring and in tenure and even in publication. That has got to stop because I think it's damaging the credibility of the entire uh, the, the entire reality-based community. Yeah, I'm definitely whether it comes to Martin Gurry's theory, you know, of it being sort of a natural organic growth of uh, uh, so many voices leads to a sort of cacophony. I, I tend to lean also towards that idea in higher ed that essentially, like, some people were attracted to certain professions and it tended to um, uh, lead to, you know, a, a self-reinforcing um, uh, ideological conformity kind of kind of situation. But since writing Coddling the American Mind, one thing that I have been made aware of um, is the, you know, one thing that I really think we underestimated was the role of, of, of departments like education, for example. Like, ha like, this was pointed out to me by Lyle Asher, that, you know, some of these real kind of in frankly intolerant kind of ideas like we saw at University of Delaware that program that this is coming from some of the education schools and it seems that some of the worst things well I do think there are I think the majority are professionals who would who would like to you know continue with with, with, uh, with the search for truth I do think there are people who really would like it to be much more uniform and that that higher ed exists to uh, to perform a political function more than a uh, more than a, a knowledge seeking one yeah you know and in fairness the American University was not born as uh, a research institution. Mm -hmm. It was born to train ministers and yeah, pastors uh -huh. and also farmers. But from there, they've got a deep DNA which says that they should be about social justice and mm -hmm. morals. So this is an old argument. Do you think I'm Pollyanna in saying that what's happening is less a politicized takeover broadly across academic academia and more a lack of diversity that's been allowed to creep in and encouraged by some forces? I think it's both happen at the same time. I think that part of it's natural, um, but it also becomes self-reinforcing. And I think that they've, I think that a lot of people in academia have, what I'd say, lost the thread, but they'd see it as, no, but we found the real thing. Like, we're trying to achieve a better society, and we, they're practicing no epistemic humility whatsoever. We, we know what the end point's supposed to look like, so what are we waiting for? But we're talking about mostly specific fields, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, definitely. We see, we've seen some problems in math departments, like yeah. some guy was pilloried because he wrote a statistical paper that, that showed it can be true that different groups can have different preferences without the presence of discrimination. But, mm. but mostly we're talking about social sciences and humanities. Yep. Is that right? That, that, as best I can and tell, we're yeah. talking primarily about elite schools. Mm -hmm. Which Although the education you, schools, the, the funny thing is, the, some of the worst policies we've seen come out of come, come out of middle tier schools, like the University of Delaware. 
Yeah, the Northeast tends, and I think you might have had this in your book, tends to have the least political diversity, the schools in the Northeast, mm -hmm. that is, uh, than schools elsewhere. But you know, fire seeds cases all look across the spectrum, not just politically, but as far as the diversity of different types of schools go. And, and this is one of the things that probably frustrates us the most about the conversation about free speech on campuses. People tend to pay attention most to those at the more elite colleges. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we have outrageous cases at places like Jones College down in Alabama or at Chicago State in Chicago. Uh, you know, a lot of our cases are at community colleges. And sometimes they don't involve the same sort of culture war issues, and that's maybe one of the reasons that they're not in the headlines as much as the other cases. But the other reason is they're just, you know, at lower tier schools in the New York kind Times of, and the yeah, Washington Post. Kind of off the grid. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and, and that is something that um, I, I say all the time, and I, I would like to repeat it again. Um, there is a huge middle of fire cases that aren't all that political um, and sometimes don't take place at the sexiest schools, even sometimes at, at fairly well-known schools. It's like a parking garage case. Yeah. Like, they lost a state, that, yeah. That they, that they get almost no coverage. If it, if, it fits a, if it fits a culture war narrative, it gets a lot more viewers, particularly if it's political correctness run amok. It actually gets better attention from the New York Times if it fits that narrative, which I find amazing. And I really wish sometimes people would focus on the big middle of cases where it, a lot of cases, it's just a, you know, a bureaucrat who has gotten a little drunk on having uh, power and no accountability. Well, I'm a huge fan, of course, of Fire's work and others' work on, on campus free speech per se, and like the Valdosta case where mm -hmm. someone criticizes the president's plan to build but basically you know, an Eastern European style monument to himself <laughs> of an unnecessary parking garage and then gets persecuted. Um, but I'm also a big fan of Heterodox Academy mm -hmm. and now the Academic Freedom Alliance and others which are starting to pay attention to what I think is in some ways kind of the underlying problem which is this lack of intellectual diversity and they're beginning to say look as academics, as, as professors, um, we're seeing the toxic effects of lack of intellectual diversity. Um, my hope is that there's enough reserves of that kind of integrity in academia so we can begin to see some focus coming from inside the academy on making sure that it's hospitable to multiple points of view. But I don't know. I mean, some people say, forget it. It's, it's not happening. Well, you spend the end of your book talking about the institutions that you think support the Constitution of Knowledge. So I would urge our uh, viewers and listeners to read that, but there is something that we can do as individuals, right? You, ha you have a quote at the end of your book, not, it's not from you, it's from a, I think a Soviet dissident and said, let your credo be this, let the lie come into the world, let it even triumph, but not through me. Mm. Who, who's Alexander that? Solzhenitsyn. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, I think we need to leave it there because we only have this room for so long. Uh, the book is The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth. It is due out on June 22nd, the author is Jonathan Rausch, and joining us in conversation today, of course. Can I make a quick announcement? Go for it. Um, I, I saved this live stream, and I'm going to announce this later this week. Kindly Inquisitors actually won the 2021 Excessively Prestigious Award <laughs> by, by popular vote. I had nothing to do with it. Um, it placed first. All right. Um, All right. <laughs> it's excessively. Um, it included a $200 uh, gift certificate to Gold Belly that he's donated back to fire. <laughs> And Thank I will you. say, I have not won the MacArthur Prize. I'm 61. I'm still waiting, maybe next year. But this is close second best. <laughs> <laughs> well, wonderful. Thank you both for being here. And uh, let us meet here again. Thank you. <laughs> this podcast is hosted and produced by me, Nico Perino, and recorded by my colleagues Aaron Reese and Chris Maltby. Uh, to learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. Take email feedback, so to speak at thefire.org. We also take reviews on Google Play and Apple Podcasts. They help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So um, that was fun. That <laughs> was fun. The, the uh, I don't, did I did I tell you this?